we have your attention, please? The second day of 7 IIMEFC and 13 ECF will begin shortly. Should there be any technical errors during the meeting, this conference will be forwarded to Webex. Please check the link showed on the screen, also the meeting numbers and password. We will read the housekeeping rules for this conference. Please ensure your electronic device is fully charged. Use earphone for better sound quality. Use the virtual background that has been provided. Please use the chat box appropriately. Please ensure you have stable internet connection. During the event, participants are requested to turn on the camera and turn off the sound. And we will read the health protocol. Keep a distance of at least 1.5 meters from others. Wear a mask. Wash your hand frequently with soap and water. Disinfect your hand regularly. Stay healthy by taking vitamins. Avoid sharing personal belongings.
Excellencies, Minister of Finance Republic of Indonesia, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, PhD, Honorables Deputy Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Dodi Budiwaluyo, Vice President of International Association for Islamic Economics, Profesor Dr. Dato Muhammad Azmi Omar, Chairman of National Research and Innovation Agency, Dr. Laksana Trihandoko, Acting De Deputy Bureau of Research and Innovation Application, National Research and Innovation Agency, Dr. Mego Pinandito, Director of Syariah Ecosystem Infrastructure of National Islamic Finance Committee, Dr. Sutan Emir Hidayat, MBA, Executive Director of Bank Indonesia Institute, Dr. Solikin M. Juhro, Distinguished Speaker and Moderator, Dr. Irfan Syaukibay, Bogor Agricultural University, Profesor Zamir Iqbal, Islamic Development Bank Saudi Arabia, Profesor Muhammad Maasumbila, King Abdul Aziz University Saudi Arabia, Dr. Jardin Ahusman, Deputy Director of Bank Indonesia, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning to all of you. First of all, praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His grace and mercies so we can gather at the second day of 7th International Islamic Monetary Economics and Finance Conference and the 13th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance today. Second, let us greet and pray to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who had brought us to the path of light. This conference provides a great opportunity for prospective participants to enhance their knowledge, research finding, and experience in dealing with Islamic economics and finance. This event will also feature presentations by prominent international speakers with cutting-edge session topic. This year's conference is held online for the second time as we acknowledge that the global pandemic has become inevitable and the world is going through a challenging moment in many ways. To begin the program, let's start by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now may we call upon Director of Sharia Ecosystem Infrastructure of National Islamic Finance Committee, Dr. Sutan Emir Hidayat, MBA, to deliver the welcoming remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Her Excellency Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance, the Republic of Indonesia, Secretary of the National Committee of Islamic Economy and Finance, KNIKS, and the Chairperson of Indonesian Association of Islamic Economists, IAEI, the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency Bapak Dodi Budiwaluyo, Deputy Governor, Bank Indonesia, Honorable Chairman of National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN, the Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Raksana Tri Handoko, along with Dr. Mego, Honorable Vice President of the International Association for Islamic Economics, IAIE, Professor Dr. Datu Muhammad Azmi Umar, Honorable Dr. Solihin M. Jufro, Head of Bank Indonesia Institute, Distinguished Speakers, Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. First and foremost, let us praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His grace and mercy so we can gather virtually at this prestigious conference. Peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the greatest role model of all time for humankind. Alhamdulillah, today we can attend the second and the final day of the 13th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance, ICF, and the 7th International Islamic Monetary Economics and Finance Conference, IIMEFC, with the team Strengthening Islamic Economy and Financial System in the Post-Pandemic Era, Digitalization and Sustainability. This joint conference is one of the important events of the Indonesia Sharia Economic Festival, ISEF 2021, which is the largest annual platform of Islamic economy in Indonesia and probably one of the biggest events, Islamic economic events in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, nowadays, Islamic economy has attracted the attention of many countries 
all over the world. This is supported by the trend of the global Muslim population that continues to increase, whereas the world's Muslim population is estimated to reach 26.4% of the world's population, or around 2.2 billion people by 2030. The growing interest in the Islamic economy sector is not just a coincidence, since it is not only creating value for consumers, but also contributing towards global well-being through its underlying socially conscious ethos. The State of Global Islamic Economic Report 2020-21 reports that consumption of halal products and services increases by 5.2% annually during 2019 to 2024, with total consumer spending reach 2.02 trillion US dollar in 2019 and will continue to grow to reach 2.4 trillion US dollar in 2024 across main sectors, namely halal food and beverage, Muslim-friendly tourism, modest fashion, halal pharmaceutical and cosmetics, as well as halal recreation and media. This figure shows that Islamic economy, particularly halal industry, still has great potential and opportunity to grow in the near future. Meanwhile, the Islamic financial industry has also been growing at a modest pace over the past few years and during pre-COVID-19 era. The sector recorded double-digit growth globally across its segments. It is projected that Islamic finance will grow at a 5% compound annual growth rate, CAGR, from 2019 to reach 3.69 trillion US dollar by 2024. Total global Islamic financial assets grew by 13.9% in 2019 to reach 2.88 trillion US dollar, fueled by higher sukuk issuances. The sukuk market, comprising 19% of total global Islamic financial assets, grew by 15% during the year and search by 18.32% in terms of issuance value. The emergence of new avenues such as green sukuk and socially responsible investing are likely to drive growth as higher attractiveness of the issuances lead to, to more issuances. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting the global economy since 2020 with a series of stimulus economic aid packages and other policy responses implemented by governments to combat the spread of the disease and survive the recession. The unprecedented event served as a momentum to rethink about the economic system that is able, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable, along with strong social safety net system. Rapid digital transformation, supported by the rise of the sharing and collaborative economy, has also contributed to a more effective and efficient resource allocation. This development has shaped a new formal, a new normal for the global Islamic economy, which requires breakthrough initiative and innovation to strengthen the ecosystem of the Islamic economy that synergize Islamic commercial finance, Islamic social finance, halal industry, and Islamic businesses in order to achieve inclusive, resilient, and sustainable growth. Despite the hindrance caused by COVID-19, last year, we still saw many notable development in the global Islamic economy, led by an acceleration in digital transformation, disruption in global supply chains, and increased government focus on food security-related investments. The global Islamic economy continues to be underpinned by some key drivers, such as a large and growing Muslim population and increasing adherence to Islamic ethical values impacting consumption and a growing number of national strategies dedicated to halal products and services development. Ladies and gentlemen, during the last decade, the development of Islamic finance has been dom dominated by the expansion and growth of the industry and the creation of Islamic banking institutions all around the globe. The industry has turned 59 years old 
in 2021 since the first ex experiments of ribawi free financial institutions that appear in 1960s namely saving investment bank in mid gamar egypt and tabung haji in malaysia the need to search for an alternative approach on economic issues that is based on islamic principles and values has emerged around the year 1950s as part of what has been called as the islamic revival afterwards modern islamic economics founded its grounds and as a discipline around 1970s the first international conference on islamic economics was organized in 1976 in Mecca, Saudi Arabia by King Abdul Aziz University, which is considered as a benchmark that symbolizes the starting point of Islamic economics as a modern paradigm of economic system. Now, alhamdulillah, we are holding the 13th series of this prestigious conference. After almost half a century of history, the discipline has evolved, consolidated, and generated multiple schools of thought. The theoretical paradigm has been translated into the expansion of the industry as the implementation of Islamic finance principle. In case when the practices depart from its theoretical foundation, then certain gaps and pitfalls will be observed and addressed in the development of the discipline, which in turn could respond or accompany those dynamics and outcomes in the more practical scope. Ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah, National Committee for Islamic Economy and Finance, KNEKS, along with Bank Indonesia, IPB University, the International Association for Islamic Economics, IAIE, the National Zakah Board, Basnas, the ISDB Institute, and Indonesian Association of Islamic Economists, IAEI, have an opportunity to hold the 13th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance and the seven international islamic monetary economics and finance conference the themes of the conference are strongly aligned with the mega trend of key developments and challenges around the world which include new normal digital transformation and islamic economy halal economy for organic growth towards global value chain islamic social finance and innovation for productive economy and poverty alleviation islamic financial development and breakthrough innovation risk sharing economy for stability and resiliency, Islamic entrepreneurship, MSMEs and startup in smart economy, Islamic economy and sustainability, green economy, circular, circular economy, business and clean technologies, institution and Islamic economy, as well as global talent development for the digital age in multi-sectors of Islamic economy. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the executive management of KNEKS, and other co-organizers. I would like to thank all the prominent speakers and all parties who have supported us in organizing this international conference. We believe that the presence of world-renowned scholars and experts in the Islamic economic fields at this conference is very much invaluable, particularly in addressing the recent issues within Islamic economic framework. I do really hope this conference will develop new knowledge and promote innovation in optimizing the role of Islamic economy and finance to effectively contribute to resiliency, sustainability, and inclusivity in the global market. Furthermore, I encourage all stakeholders to implement Islamic economic principles and collaborate with Indonesia to optimize the role of Islamic economy and finance in the global economy. Finally, I do hope all of you will have productive dialogue and fruitful discussion during the second day of this conference. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, doctor, for the welcoming remarks. Esteemed guests, we are now going to listen to the keynote speech by Chairman of National Research and Innovation Agency, Dr. Laksana Trihandoko, represented by Acting Deputy Bureau of Research and Innovation Application, Dr. Mego Pinandito. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dut for this uh, organizing committee, the chairman of International uh, Committee uh, of Economic and uh, Finance Conference, and also with the local organizing committee chairs who are uh, giving the opportunities. Uh, on behalf of the national uh, agency or national research and innovation agency, the Republic of Indonesia, first I would like to deliver my deepest uh, gratitude for the seven international Islamic monitoring uh, monitor, monetary uh, economic and finance conference, and also the international conference on Islamic and finance, 2021. Uh, in this situation, it is still in the time of the pandemic, so that uh, almost uh, uh, the, the conference are also doing in the virtual. Here, I would like to convey the information about uh, our institution, BRIN, as the one of the, the new governmental institution with the strategy and also the direction and some targets as happening years. As we know that the BRII, the uh, National uh, Research and Innovation Agency is the governmental institution directly under the President of the Republic of Indonesia, which has mandate to conduct the integrated research and development, assessment and application, as well as the inventions and innovations. Uh, I would like to ask for this uh, permission to share screen, if possible. already uh, display well. Okay. Hopefully it, it can be seen well. It's okay. And uh, regarding to these activities, uh, our institute uh, try to make sure that all of these activities are already con uh, consolidating as the national science and technology uh, resources, that is including the human resources, uh, research and development infrastructure regarding to this uh, activities, uh, uh, of course, the, the programs, uh, especially the, how the, the, the funding or the budget will come. And the secondly is to create the open global standard research and economic in the ecosystem, which is collaborative, but inclusive. So everybody can also use that platform, as we know that uh, somehow it is need to be uh, maintained well. And of course, uh, to creating the strong and excellent uh, research ecosystem to support the national economic growth and also based on the sustainable development. I think this is also the important thing that uh, sustainability uh, developments are the base on all what we like to do in the research and innovations. And some uh, target that will be uh, setting is how to make sure that uh, to accelerate the, we know that research and innovation need such kind of the critical mass, so it will become uh, enabled to uh, transform to, to the business process and also the research management and focusing on the research, especially to uh, accelerate, uh, to get the added value economy based on the natural resources and biodiversity and geographically also the art and cultural diversity. So it means that almost uh, if you look at the biodiversity we have in land and also in ocean. Now uh, still uh, almost the research and innovation activity on the biodiversity are focusing on the land. So uh, the National uh, Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN, set some a program to get more and more uh, 
possibility to do research and innovation in the sea, in the oceans. Because we know that if you look at the uh, activities on the sustainable developments, uh, we cannot exploit almost all of the uh, materials coming from the land, but also we have tried to use uh, every, uh, what we call the materials in the sea or in the oceans. And reshaping the Indonesia as the global uh, excellent research center and uh, platform for the conducting these uh, biodiversity, geographic, and also art cultural research, make it more and more to adopt and also to make some uh, engagement even with the uh, domestic institution, uh, also with the international or overseas uh, institution. So this is uh, what we call the global collaboration. If we look at the, the right one is we are doing with the universities, the academic and also the research institute. Uh, we have such kind of the capacity building on the PhD by research program and also postdoctoral. And the other thing is about the mobility program. The right, the, the opposite one, the left hand is uh, supported and also offering to the, the business uh, players, to the industries. For example, to use uh, our facilities uh, that uh, already been uh, proven scientifically and also to comply with the regulation and the standard. So in the case of this collaboration on the industry uh, uh, problem resolves are also very important. And also, if we look at the investment of the risk on the research and innovation, it is very uh, opportunity uh, to uh, reduce the investment by the industry. So I think this is uh, one important thing that we try to improve the research and innovation ecosystem, especially when doing the uh, activity in business. And of course, uh, the creating of uh, this uh, research uh, institution, improving the economic impact of the research activity established as the science and technology platform are promising in the investment of the potential national and the international partner. For example, if, if you look at the, uh, the future research with uh, which the brain set uh, in, in the priority is regarding to the, for example, the digital and blue green economic research and innovations, uh, as uh, I described before is uh, doing with the biodiversity research and its added value development, the drug and also medicine and medical device development. And the other thing is we know that the space technology, the technology for disaster management and mitigation. And of course, uh, we don't, uh, uh, it is not possible to you. Uh, the social humaniora and archaeology are also very important. In the case of this uh, uh, future research and innovation, we need such kind of the very important uh, parts or uh, factor is the high performance computings, artificial intelligence, and also digital world, digital uh, IT, and with the biodiversity and the database in uh, finally as uh, the big data, even with the drug and medical uh, devices and also precision technology. So for supporting this activity to be uh, in the research is uh, the research uh, results in the uh, good quality uh, with the quality assurance and performance. So we need such kind of, uh, for example, the national or the global standard regulation that uh, all of the activities uh, should be uh, complied. And also with the measurement and the measuring standard that should be uh, maintained. And of course, uh, the certified reference material conformity assessment infrastructure and quality assurance management system, again, uh, should be uh, supported by the science, technology, and innovation. In the case of this, so again, we will try to make, for example, the international or global class of the laboratories, uh, for example, for the biology, biochemical, and also biochemical uh, environment laboratories, 
we setting such kind of the research uh, research vessels with the several vessels for the deep sea research capacity and of course with the aerospace technology launch and botanical garden for the uh, plant conservation since we if you look at the biodiversity research and value added component it should be uh, uh, what we call the activities uh, to maintain all of the plan uh, or we call the plan conservation this is just the open research infrastructure for national international standard uh, there is uh, one is the in the chibinong called the chibinong science and techno park with the integrated modern technology laboratories we are also doing the center of biodiversity uh, tra uh, traditional food and processing and of course with the halal standard so it is very important to us to make sure that all of the food are already uh, been uh, guaranteed as the standard food and of course with the national integrity for the genomics uh, tropical biodiversity and environment and of course this is just to show uh, uh, what we've been uh, built in the infrastructure for research for the halal food uh, we know that uh, the such research are uh, with the halal uh, requirement and the laboratory are also specifically set and uh, with the appropriate uh, technology for the halal uh, laboratories and finally to have such kind of industrial uh, halal product in the uh, future so uh, in the beginning it is still in the micro or the small medium enterprise and hopefully uh, bring and with uh, such kind of the institution and with uh, doing together uh, with the the group of uh, uh, society it become more uh, uh, prepare and ready to be uh, what we, we call the UMKM Go International. Under this uh, circumstance, the new one, we try to again to improve this and strengthening the international collaboration. So this is uh, what we call uh, the, for example, for the ocean research innovation, we uh, have a program of uh, ocean research, the extreme ecosystem research on the deep sea, the geobiodiversity of the submarine volcanoes, uh, we call the Eco Depot, which has uh, consists of six uh, components. First is the research truce or vessels. The second one is for the geology and geophysics uh, activities, uh, research, oceanography, biodiversity, biotechnology, and the instrumentation and engineering. Since we know that uh, with this uh, research uh, vessels, it is uh, become very important to know what uh, kind of the biota or what how to take uh, the samples for the geological uh, on the bottom of the sea and so on. Of course, uh, regarding to the data processing and analysis, it become very big data. So the maintain of the big data and also the information in secure um, uh, method are very important to do and this, again uh, ladies and gentlemen in the global science technology and innovation it plays an important role in the development of the new uh, product of the new thinking regarding to the the science and technology somehow uh, it is linked to the what we have uh, has in indonesia for uh, for example in the ocean research the, the other thing is, if you look at the research and innovation in medical and health, several activities, uh, for example, in the protection, in the screening and diagnostics, the treatment, medical devices, and also research on the human uh, social humaniora, it is very important since we know that several uh, understanding regarding to the, for example, the COVID-19 is uh, differ between others. And finally, we know that such kind of the uh, understandings are also very important to be uh, set a priority in uh, how to announce or how to make the information appropriate to the uh, society. The other things, if you look at the, in the future uh, in medical and health and the medical and uh, also the uh, therapy, 
we know that the almost of the activities are including in the what we call the biomolecular or the biotechnology. So, uh, for example, the using of the, the whole uh, genome sequencing in personal medical data is very important. We know that such kind of the uh, medicines are uh, specifically or uh, privately, individually uh, set by uh, such kind of the research. So I think in the future, the modern uh, medical therapy and also medicines are really need uh, research and innovation on the, the big data. And, and it is already known that if you look at the personal medical data, the information security are very, very important. I think uh, this is just the only uh, information that if you look at the how to make sure that the, uh, what you call, to make the uh, sustainable development in the research and how to the economic uh, finally can be uh, gained it will be very important to do the research and innovation in the appropriate uh, way. I think that is uh, what we'd like to uh, share in this uh, opportunity. And again, thank you very much. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, doctor. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to listen to keynote speech by Vice President of International Association for Islamic Economics, Professor Dr. Dato Muhammad Asmi Omar. Thank you very much, the sister moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Her Excellency Ibu Sri Mulyani, Minister of Finance Indonesia, as well as Chairman of Indonesian Association of Islamic Economics. Uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, senior officials from the uh, various government agencies, uh, including from KNEKS, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Mego from Brin, the distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and good morning to all of you. On behalf of the International Association of Islamic uh, Economics, I would like to extend my appreciation to the organizers for inviting me to deliver a keynote address at the second day of the 13th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance, as well as the 7th International Islamic Monetary Finance Conference. I am indeed honored and delighted uh, to see so many distinguished speakers at this prestigious conference. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Standard & Poor Global Ratings, the global Islamic finance industry, which now stands at about 2.2 trillion US dollars, is expected to recover from a 10.6% growth rate in 2020 and it is expected to grow in the range of 10 to 12% over the 2021 to 2022 period. This is a slight increase or recovery if we compare to the 2019 growth rate, which stood at 17.3%. This optimistic view of Islamic finance growth is predicated on the basis of a modest economic recovery in the main Islamic finance markets, such as GCC countries and South and Southeast Asian countries. Hence, we expect to see increasing suku issuance by sovereigns as well as multilaterals together with an increase in bank financing in a number of growth sectors. SMP also forecasts global suku issuance to reach $140 billion to $155 billion in 2021, roughly an increase from $140 billion in 2020. And this increase is largely due to the increase in availability of liquidity, as well as sustained financing needs among corporates as well as governments. 
now we see more countries have opened up the economies by reducing COVID-19 restrictions and opening up their borders as we see increasing vaccination rates in many countries. Hence, we are quite optimistic that Islamic finance growth will continue and possibly reach almost $3.3 trillion by 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, if we look deeper into the reasons for the continued growth of Islamic finance, also to a certain extent mentioned by earlier speakers, we can identify at least four factors. The first one is demographics of Muslim population. The global Muslim population has an average age of 24 years old. Indeed, very young. Most of them are religiously inclined and are looking to adopt Islamic financial solutions. In addition, Muslims as a group have a higher growth rate and are expected to comprise 26.4% of the global population by 2030. Indonesia and Pakistan, the two OIC countries with the, with the largest Muslim population today, will have a population grown to 238 million and 258 million respectively by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, the second factor for the continued demand for Islamic finance is financial inclusion agenda. And as we know, this is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this is actively implemented in many OIC countries. Financial inclusion is measured by the access to financial services by all sectors of society at an affordable cost. Financial services encompass bank accounts, affordable credit, insurance, payments, and trade transactions. According to the Global Findex Report 2017, and again, this is the, still the most recent report, high-income economies have a considerably higher bank account ownership at 94%. In contrast, in developing countries, where most of the OIC countries are located, it stood at 37%. So if you do a total analysis, you will find that a significant percentage of the world's unbanked population is located in OIC countries. The third factor, ladies and gentlemen, is the halal economy. Many OIC countries are promoting halal economy as a new source of growth. They have developed many types of trade facilitation initiatives to support the growth of micro and SMEs for domestic and international halal trade. In parallel to this, the emphasis to have an end-to-end -end value chain for halal trade to include the source and availability of Sharia compliant financing to support the micro and SMEs is another pivotal support to Islamic finance. The fourth final factor is the demand for ethical or sustainable finance. Islamic finance is part of the ethical sustainable finance. As Islamic finance is not involved in any gambling activities, excessive speculative activities, Islamic finance provides a strong link to the real economy and promotes a risk sharing economy. As the world gets more increasingly affected by climate change, increasing poverty and inequality in both income and wealth there are opportunities for Islamic finance to provide the solution. Already, we are seeing Islamic finance institutions in countries such as Malaysia implementing value-based intermediation and value-based takaful, incorporating sustainability agenda in their decision-making. We also see similar initiatives in other countries such as here in Indonesia under the sustainability finance agenda. All of this agenda, ladies and gentlemen, are based on Makassid Asharia i.e. meeting the objectives of Sharia. Ladies and gentlemen, in my mind, there are three pillars of sustainable finance that Islamic financial institutions should incorporate in their financing, investment, and takaful business. The first pillar is economic prosperity, where Islamic financial institutions should look beyond profit and consider returns from all stakeholders rather than for shareholders only. 
profit should not be the only yardstick for success. The second pillar is people stewardship. Islamic financial institutions must incorporate social variables dealing with community, education, equity, social resources, health, well-being, and quality of life in their decision-making, which means that any decision-making impacting the community, impacting the health and the well-being of the community, the society, must be incorporated in Islamic financial institutions decision making. The third pillar, ladies and gentlemen, is environmental stewardship. Islamic financial institutions must consider the impact of their financing, their investment and takaful decisions on environmental issues relating to natural resources, water, sanitation and air quality, energy conversation, energy conservation and land use. No longer should Islamic finance be looking only, as I mentioned earlier on, from the profit perspective. All three pillars must be incorporated in their decision-making. Implementing sustainability agenda matters most to Islamic finance. It is not now a matter of choice. A choice. It is now not a matter of choice, but something that Islamic finance institutions must embrace and implement. I can mention at least four reasons for this. Next slide, please. The first one is Islamic ethical principles are inbuilt into the DNA of Islamic finance. As I mentioned, why sustainability matters for Islamic finance. The first one is Islamic ethical principles are inbuilt into the, the DNA of Islamic finance. Second one is Islamic finance is inherently tied to the real economy. Third, Fulfilling the objectives of Sharia, Makassid Sharia, should be the basis of Islamic finance and Islamic economic system. Moving beyond Sharia compliance to fulfilling the objectives of Sharia, we should be focusing on halal and toyibat rather than purely on halal, but focusing on goodness, wholesome, which is good for the whole community, for the whole society, as well as for the whole country. I would like to quote a statement by the former governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, Tan Sri Muhammad Ibrahim in 2017, which he said, the next frontier and the major milestone would be positioning Islamic finance to become more prominent and leading agent of positive change for the financial system and operates within a network economy that is built upon shared values of integrity, inclusivity, and sustainability. Greater attention will be devoted to value creation and value-based businesses that reflect the true essence of Islamic finance. Ladies and gentlemen, the one of the interesting developments we see today due to COVID-19 is the increase in digitalization. And along with this development is the expansion of Islamic fintech. And Indonesia is at the center of Islamic fintech growth. Islamic fintech are offered in many verticals from payment, digital banking, crowdfunding, equity, as well as debt moraba based financing for trade and working capital, takaful tech, Islamic social finance fintechs, such as for zakat, sadaka, and waka, and also robo advisory for investments, to name a few. We have also seen several Islamic fintechs supporting the financing and investment of micro and small and medium enterprises. However, the key to ensure the success of Islamic fintech rests on several things. These are, next slide please, having the right regulatory and supervisory framework and policies. Secondly, the existence of supporting institutions such as accelerators and digital labs. Third, the availability of funding and different types of funding for different stages of startups. And finally, of course, human capital and talent development to support the growth of fintechs. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, Islamic Sharia or Sharia finance, as it's called in some other countries, is growing and will continue to grow in the near future due to the above demands, which I mentioned earlier. Islamic fintechs will be a key enabler to increase the size and growth of Islamic finance in years to come not only in OIC countries, but also in countries 
where there are significant Muslim population, such as in Europe. Islamic finance must embrace sustainability agenda as we have to move beyond Sharia compliance to meeting the objectives of Sharia. Together, digitalization, especially Islamic fintech, and a focus on sustainability will help to steer Islamic finance as an important contributor to strengthening Islamic economy and financial system in the post-pandemic era. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I end with a wilahi tafiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, may we have the honor to invite Her Excellencies, Minister of Finance Republic of Indonesia, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, PhD, to deliver the keynote speech. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to all of you, especially the Honorable Vice President of International Association for Islamic Economics, uh, Professor Dr. Datuk Muhammad Asmi Omar, uh, my colleague from the Green as well as from uh, EAEE. Uh, first of all, we are all should be very thankful with the blessing of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that we are all today have the, this conference, international conference. And uh, we would like to also express my appreciation to KNEKS, Bank Indonesia, BASNAS, and EIAE, as well as International Association for Islamic Economics for conducting this event. The topic of our today discussion is very timely. That is the strengthening Islamic economy and financial system in the post-pandemic era, and also digitalization, as well as sustainability. These are all the three very critical and important, which is disrupting globally, that is pandemic, digital technology, and sustainability, which lead to the climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, currently we are still facing with the first issue, that is the pandemic era in which globally the world is still struggling to deal with the development of the new variant. In 2020, uh, all countries in the world have to do or to adopt an extraordinary policy in order for each country and economy to be able to deal, to deal with this uh, pandemic COVID-19. Whether this is on a health area, as well as social support, and also in supporting uh, business community. Total global fiscal stimulus in 2020 estimated by all countries in the world reached 12 trillion US dollars. This is not only in dealing with the health, but also the consequences on the social and economic implication of this COVID. So COVID and pandemic uh, has definitely uh, creating a huge cost for all countries in the world. Alhamdulillah, globally now, economy is starting to recover, uh, although this is still uneven. Many countries which still struggle with dealing with the new variant and also the access of vaccine, which is not distributed uh, fairly across country as well as economy. In addition to the pandemic, which is already costing a lot and have a huge implication for all the multidimensional which I mentioned earlier, we also dealing with the climate change challenge. And these are all also the nature of the problem is borderless, meaning that no country can deal with this issue alone. And that's why this is maybe one of the most challenging for global economy to deal the situation or challenge or threat in this case which have no jurisdiction in terms of uh, their uh, implication. At the same time, we also see digital technology shaping as well as disrupting the real economy as well as financial economy. 
So how we are going to address these three very critical issues? During the annual meeting IMF World Bank last week, these three topics has become the most important topic, which is being discussed uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, meeting, but also during the G20 finance and central bank meeting. Indonesia is going to hold the presidency of G20 beginning uh, this December and for the whole 2022. Our theme in this presidency is how globally the world can recover together and recover stronger. It's a very high call and very ambitious, but certainly it will require a lot of coordination, cooperation and synergy and harmony in terms of how we are going to design the policy and at the same time navigating the continued challenging environment. Let me provide you with a little bit update on our economic situation. Alhamdulillah, Indonesian economy is already now also showing the sign of recovery. This is mainly because the ability to manage the trend of increasing COVID-19 due to the Delta variant in a very effective and relatively short time. Indonesia can witness now the normalization of the activity especially starting late August and continue in September. Our second quarter this year, 2021, economic growth has been very uh, quite impressive, above 7%, and our GDP level is already uh, surpassing the pre-COVID level. So these are all the recovery process, which is driven by all sorts of growth, consumption, investment, government spending as well as external forces like export, creating a much more balanced growth. It doesn't mean that, that Indonesia economy, in this case, not suffering of what we call it the scar effect, just like many countries uh, and many economy in the world. And this is exactly how we are going to uh, continue making sure that the policy is going to address the issue of health challenge, which is still continue. Uh, remain very challenging. Indonesia still have to strive for what you call it immunization for uh, this vaccine of COVID-19. Uh, the president have the target that the Indonesia should reach 70% to achieve herd immunity before the end of the year. That means that we have to vaccinate around 2.5 million people per day. It's a very big number and, of course, also challenging given the, demo, uh, the geographic uh, situation in Indonesia. But this is the challenge that Indonesia is going to continue uh, match with the effort from both central government and local government. Vaccination is the necessary condition for the recovery. But the second one, which is critically also important, is continue adopting health protocol in order for us to be able to start the economic activity, social activity, including the religious activity, but without uh, creating increasing risk of contagion of this COVID-19. So with this kind of situation, the question is how a country like Indonesia can design the recovery economy, which is at the same time also recognizing the three area of topic which we discussed today. That is the threat of the pandemic itself, the second one is the digital technology. And the third one is the sustainability. And within our discussion today, we also want to make sure that the objective of SARIA, that is Makasit, Makasit SARIA, which is the universal value of Islam in the practice of the economy, can also strengthening the effort of the recovery. The policy that we design is definitely reflecting this objective of Sharia, which is what we call it a just or equitable society. How we are going to correct, in this case, any distortion that creating inequality or unjust society. The role of state budget is very critical. Let us see how we are designing the state budget which is promoting more and more equality. First, fulfilling sufficient basic human needs. This is very critical. 
This is aligned well with the priority that President Jokowi outlined, that is human capital is very critical. This is already mentioned by previous speaker that within Islamic fintech as well as Makassit, the role of human capital is very critical. So Indonesia dedicate a significant amount of our budget spending for human capital, whether this is in the form of education spending, health spending, and social safety net. Health spending is now reaching more than 6%. Education spending by our constitution, we have to allocate 20% of our budget and social safety net which including also subsidy for the poorest family. This is how the Indonesia tried to cut what we call it poverty uh, among generation or across generation, intergenerational poverty that need to be stopped uh, among other by using our budget and intervention of the government. Making sure that whoever the population in Indonesia, no one lived behind they are going to be able to get a good health as well as education services. The second one on this Makassit is about the distribution of uh, property, wealth and income. The government is also providing in addition to the cash transfer or social spending to support the poorest family, the most vulnerable. But at, this, at the same time, we also implement tax system, including the income tax system, which is progressive, meaning that for those who has more ability, they will pay more. And the collection of this tax is for supporting the poor and also building the basic infrastructure, which is going to be also very useful, especially for the poor family to be able to get the job and have the productivity. So taxation is actually reflecting what we call it, the principle of equality, the design of taxation in order for us to be able to address the issue of equality is very critical. The third principle is equal right and opportunity in doing business. This is democratization of business opportunity. Again, based on the value of Islam in which you are providing a deal it is uh, equal opportunity and at the same time, less distortion, providing equal opportunity for all to be able to thrive. But of course, equal opportunity cannot reflect it to this, what we call it keadilan or uh, a just society. Uh, if the poor family again, cannot have the same starting point. That's why again, within the policy of the government in addressing the equality and creating a just society, even though you create an equal opportunity, doesn't guarantee that you are going to achieve the same result, especially when the poor family and poor kids cannot get the same starting point. So these are all maybe can be seen as the regular fiscal policy but actually reflecting the value of Islam. This is actually the exercising or implementing the principle of the Islam within the design of how we are going to uh, address the issue of not only pandemic, but also in addressing the issue of uh, poverty and creating a more equality and just society. So ladies and gentlemen, now let me uh, address the issue on how Islamic economic finance, and especially during this pandemic, which is showing as a resilient. I think the previous speaker from the first one and then the previous one has already mentioned about uh, the economic and finance, which is based on uh, Islam, is showing a resiliency during this pandemic. Bank Indonesia noted that the growth of the main halal value chains uh, especially in agriculture and food remain positive and also above the average GDP growth. Other sector, particularly tourism, uh, experiencing a deep contraction during this pandemic. The sector growth, which is uh, showing a very strong, of course, uh, opportunity during this pandemic 
is the e-commerce on halal product. Islamic finance industry sector and Islamic banking financing distribution is relatively also showing a stable uh, growth during this pandemic. This is supported by low level of non-performing finance or NPL, as well as relatively stable value of asset and third party funds, as well as capital adequacy ratio. In addition, the fundamental of Islamic capital market and Islamic non-bank financial in industry also still relatively well maintained. The global Islamic capital market, uh, in this case, Indonesia, is among the main contributor of the global Islamic capital market. And we are all see the increasing both in terms of volume of the transaction as well as instrument which is being traded. The issue of sukuk by Indonesian sovereign is actually one of the biggest landmark at the international market since 2018 until 2021, we issued 3.5 billion, uh, which is actually also quite remarkable given the fact that in 2020, the situation at the global capital market is not really uh, suitable and favorable, but yet Indonesia was still continue able to issue this kind of sukuk with a quite uh, competitive yield. Internationally, uh, the global issue of 23.65 billion, in which 23.1%, is actually a share from the Indonesia, which is actually very significant. In June 2021, just recently, we also issued a sovereign green suku on the global market at 750 million US dollar. Again, we are using a quite an opportunistic situation in with low interest rate in this case equal interest rate is actually providing us with the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to issue the instrument which is based on Sharia. Ladies and gentlemen, how we are going to see post pandemic in terms of the growth of the economy or the recovery of economy as well as the development of Islamic economy and finance. Currently, Islamic economy has become a new attraction in the global economy. I think previous speaker has already mentioning at least four factors which I support uh, and agree fully. That is the demographic in this case of the global Muslim population, which is relatively also young and also still growing as one of the most important factors. The second one is the digital technology. The third, uh, third one is the growing halal industry as the source of growth. And the fourth one, is the sustainable concern, which I think match very much uh, with the value of the Islam. Uh, we are all see uh, today that this four factor is becoming one of the most important fundamental for the eco economy, which is based on Islam, can be growing. But the question, of course, for all of us to be able to first, making sure that it can fit and creating a solution by innovating the instrument for all parties to be able to then use this, what we call it, Sharia compliant instrument as a solution on the financing as well as the is, uh, addressing the issue, which is structurally and fundamentally important. Whether this is related to the SDG or poverty, whether this is related to the innovation. I think this is going to be very critical. So I also agree with the previous speaker that this is supposed to be beyond Sharia compliant. It's supposed to be focused on the Sharia objective. That is the objective to create a just and prosper population or uh, society. So for Indonesia, Islam, Islamic banking uh, also playing a very important, uh, which is for us, this is the first is a com commercial Islamic institution, which play still the dominant 
uh, as well as the important institutional as well as financial sector in Indonesia. Even with that kind of recognition, the share of Islamic banking in Indonesia is still relatively small, which is 6.5%. Currently, the government is already also merged three Islamic banking owned by the government in order to create an economic of scale. But certainly, they still need to be supported by quality of professional competent uh, human capital as well as the ability to expand by looking at, at the opportunity of the new source of growth, including the halal industries. The second one is on the digital uh, technology, which is also previously has been mentioned by previous speaker. We have all seen during this pandemic, the transformation toward digital technology is even more accelerated. Digital technology is already providing disruption, but also opportunity. So for all of us to actually take this digital technology as one of the instrument in order for us to be able to implement Islamic value is very, very important. Because if we are not really looking at the very detailed digital technology, including digital finance can create exploitation. In Indonesia, I think we are all now see the example, which is not a good example, like Pinjaman online, in which uh, people suffer from this uh, kind of practice. So for all of us, how we are going to use this digital technology, including FinTech, to create and to implement more what we call it a regulatory framework, which reflecting adjust as well as non-exploitative uh, financial practices. Within that context, I think this is going to be one of the challenges for the economic association of the Islamic e Economic Association to think very hard how we are going to be able to first designing the regulatory framework, the second one designing the institution, uh, the, the, the institution which is implementing this regulatory and policy framework, the institution which is credible enough. The third one, what kind of instrument which can use this digital fintech as a way to create more financial inclusion in a safe and just way, rather than exploitative for those which is less literate on the financial side. This is going to be one of the most important because more and more people now using and relying on digital technology in their daily life. On this Islamic finance, I think we also can use digital technology in order for us to be able to promote many of what we call it social finance. This is including how we are going to create like, uh, and promote BMT that, that is Baitul Mal Wal Tamwil or Islamic Cooperative globally. Digital technology definitely will provide this platform with a much less cost and a much higher efficiency. Currently in Indonesia, there are 4,500 BMT that help society, particularly in a rural area, in uh, accessing microfinance. I think with this kind of uh, principle, we should look more the underlying principle in order for us to be able to create more access of finance, especially for uh, poor family, as well as the smallest uh, unit, uh, uh, or we call it microfinance. We also see the BMT in this case can play a very important role uh, in order for us to be able to provide alternative source of capital and also creating uh, resiliency, especially during this pandemic, in which many of small medium enterprises suffer directly because of pandemic, which uh, restriction uh, of the movement of the people, definitely creating a huge handicap for many small medium enterprises to continue uh, their business. So digital platform definitely provide, uh, in this case, a solution but how we are going to use this platform, which is still consistent with the Islamic value. We also see in this case, 
the digital technology can also promote, as I mentioned earlier, the social finance. Social finance such, such as Zakat, Infact, and Sodako uh, will also can or, or can be promoted by using digital platform. In 2020, our Zakat, Infact, and Sodako collection is 12.7 trillion uh, rupiah. This is increased from 17.3 trillion uh, uh, in 2021. The collection in Indonesia increased by 30% if you compare with 2019. So with this kind of situation, we actually see the opportunity how the digital technology can provide the easy, easy way for people to exercise their social and altruist uh, behavior by also using this digital technology in order for them to be able to pay zakat, infak, and sodako. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, provide you with my closing that all this, the digital technology, can only create what you call it, an opportunity for all population in Indonesia if we have the infrastructure, digital infrastructure which is allowing especially for the population in the remote and poorest area to be able to also enjoy the internet connection and digital technology. And that's why for Indonesia, even though maybe this is not least, uh, being seen as a direct Islamic uh, program, but the government spending on the digital infrastructure basically creating a widespread and equal opportunity especially for our population, which is still live in the outer uh, and remote and poor uh, region. This is, again, is very consistent with the Islamic value in which we are supposed to provide support for those needed. And for those of you who has the capacity, you have to also providing your ability to help the poorest in order for us to be able to create a just society. So with this kind of situation, I think I would like to close by saying that for all of us to be able to promote the Islamic finance in an inclusive way, we are not only uh, limited ourselves to only what we call it, as mentioned by previous speaker, a Sharia compliant in a very narrow way. We also have to be able to translate the Islamic value in an inclusive, which can also influencing and shaping policy at the macro level, which have a huge and significant impact for the population, especially in striving against poverty and creating equal prosperity. This is going to be one of the most important for the Islamic economy to also discuss. So I would like to close by saying that all the effort made by all of us, the stakeholder, in order to promote Islamic value, which is going to be complementing for the focus on a very narrow Sharia compliance, but also complemented by a good sound macro policy, which also designing in a way that can create more equitable and just society will be strengthening uh, the, the Islamic value indirectly. So with that, I would like to uh, congratulate all the organizers for having this conference. And I do hope that all of you will have a very productive discussion. Bilahi Taufik wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Minister of Finance, Republic of Indonesia, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, PhD, for the keynote speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you all to join virtual group photos. Group photos will be taken twice. Please be ready. First photo will be taken in one, two, Three. Second photo in one, 
two, three. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin to our main agenda today, the plenary session on Islamic banking and finance for economic recovery and sustainable development in digital era, we would like to invite you to join the parallel sessions. Please check the links on the screen. We hope to see you again on 3 p.m. Jakarta time with the same Zoom link for the plenary sessions and announcement of Best Paper GMF 2021. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, may we have your attention, please. The second plenary session of 7th EEMFC and 13th ECF will begin shortly. Welcome back, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We shall begin to our main agenda today, the plenary session on Islamic banking and finance for economic recovery and sustainable development in digital era with the prominent speakers. Before we begin the plenary session, we would like to ask moderator and all speakers to turn their cameras on as we will have a group photo. The photo will be taken in one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. And now we shall begin to the plenary session. To lead this discussion is Dr. Irfan Shauki Beik from, from Bogor Agricultural University. Before we invite our moderator, we would like to introduce him to you. Dr. Irfan Shauki Beik is an associate professor at the Department of Islamic Economics, Bogor Agricultural University. Since February 2021, Dr. Irfan serves as commissioner at the Indonesia Wakaf Board, or BWI. He received his PhD in Islamic Economics from International Islamic University, Malaysia, in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please welcome our moderator, Dr. Irfan Shauki Beik. Thank you very much, Sister MC. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon in Indonesia. Good morning and good day, good night in other parts of the world. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express our gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his mercy we can gather here in order to attend uh, our uh, second plenary session of uh, this uh, prestigious conference. And in this session, we are going to discuss a very important topic, which is Islamic banking and finance for economic recovery and sustainable development in digital era. And Alhamdulillah, we are honored to have uh, distinguished speakers that will share their ideas and thought on the uh, topic discussed. Uh, the speakers that will share their uh, uh, thoughts and ideas are Professor Zamir Iqbal, Professor Muhammad Masumbillah, and Dr. Jardin Husman. Before we begin uh, with the presentation of the first speaker, allow me to introduce you with uh, the background of uh, our distinguished speakers for today's plenary session. Professor Zamir Iqbal uh, served as the Vice President Finance and Chief Financial Officer at the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, prior to joining this uh, Islamic Development Bank, he served as the head of the World Bank Global Islamic Finance Development Center in Istanbul. He has more than 25 years of experience of capital market, asset management, risk management, and financial sector at the World Bank, uh, Treasury in the Washington District of Columbia. Islamic finance has been his research focus and he has co-authored of several articles and books on Islamic finance, and he earned his PhD in international finance from the George Washington University. And uh, the second uh, distinguished speaker will be uh, Professor Muhammad Ma'asum Billah, who is a well-known professor of finance, insurance, fintech, and investment Islam economic, uh, at the Islamic Economic Institute of the King Abdul Aziz University, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He is currently the member of the audit board of ACIG, which is appointed by the Saudi Monetary Authority. Professor Masum Billah has been serving and contributing both academic as well as corporate industries and international organizations for more than 25 years. In addition, he had also been affiliated with corporate, academic, and financial industries, including central banks, international corporate organizations, governments, and the NGOs. Last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Jadin uh, Husman, 
our third uh, panelist. Uh, she is now uh, the Deputy Director at the Department of Islamic Economy and Finance of the Bank Indonesia. She earned his, her PhD in economics from the University of Warwick, United Kingdom, and graduated in the year 2015. And she has a lot of experiences. Among them uh, are uh, the chairman of the working group Technical Notes on Islamic Liquidity Management Tools at the Islamic Financial Services Board uh, from July 2020 up to now. And she's also the member of technical committee at the Islamic Financial Services Board since May 2018. So Alhamdulillah, uh, with this background, I know that uh, the discussion will be very productive. And since uh, Professor Zamir Iqbal has an urgent matter, so uh, after his presentation, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, the other speakers permission to give a Q&A session first for Professor Zamir Iqbal, uh, Zamir Iqbal before we continue with the second and the third uh, speakers. So hopefully you are okay with this uh, arrangement. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Zamir Iqbal to share his ideas on the topic. And you have uh, 20 minutes uh, to present uh, your paper and allow me to remind you two minutes before this 20 minutes presentation end. The time and screen are yours. Falya Tafadol Mashkur. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And I hope you can see me as well. Uh, unfortunately, there's something issue with, looks like with the camera that you've not been able to. Can you hear me well? Can yes, you yes, we can hear you well, uh, Prof. Zabir. Okay, okay. So I don't know what's the issue with the camera because I'm putting the, the virtual background and it's causing the somehow to freeze the camera. Um, you know, it's quite possible that unfortunately I am in the, uh, right now I'm in uh, traveling on business trip in Dubai. And because of that, um, maybe the videos they are being disabled over here. So anyway, I'm very sorry that I would not be aware. Somehow you cannot see me, but Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone. Um, I really thank Bank Indonesia for the invitation and all the other organizers uh, giving me the opportunity to be with you. Um, uh, it is a very, very important uh, topic, especially given that uh, what the world has gone through in the last uh, couple of uh, months. So um, I would, what I would like to do is uh, just give you a flavor, uh, an idea of what um, the many of the Islamic countries, especially in the OIC countries, have been impacted by COVID-19 and what the Islamic Development Bank is doing in that respect, and maybe some, some ideas on what Islamic finance can do, um, or maybe going forward, how people can benefit from the, some of the ideas of the Islamic finance. So with that, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so um, I think one thing we have a very, very clear uh, with us uh, that um, um, COVID-19 was totally unexpected. We were not ready for it. And this is probably in our modern uh, history, the first crisis, uh, which was uh, uh, did not come from an economic or financial sector, but it impacted the economic and financial sector very much. If you look at the chart, which you see on the uh, on my screen, the left hand side, you will see that uh, the, the projection was the, um, that the GDP, the world global GDP will continue to increase. However, when you see from 2019, uh, we had a dip to, in 2020, although the recovery started and the projections are that recovery will continue, inshallah, in 2022, but still we are not even at a stage where we would have been if there was no COVID. Um, and the other thing is uh, when you notice that uh, on the, the chart on the right-hand side shows you that uh, we have a, um, uh, the emerging markets and the developing countries are the one which were hit much harder. The uh, reason being that uh, as you know, their economies are fragile to some extent, they're not very well developed. So therefore they're the one who are having a a slower recovery compared to the developed countries. Um, and at the same time, uh, th th there is quite a bit uncertainty on which way the recovery will go. 
Now, another uh, sad part of the whole uh, COVID-19 impact is that um, you probably all you are aware that we, uh, the development community has a, a Millennium Development Goals, which were uh, targeted to reduce the poverty, uh, the, the eliminate the poverty. And we were doing a very good, um, uh, you know, uh, progress on that. However, uh, we, we noticed that because of COVID, we have lost that progress, which we're making to eliminate poverty, extreme poverty. And it is estimated that by um, uh, probably the end of this year or so, uh, about 100 million people will fall back into the extreme poverty. So that is a not a very good news in the sense that whatever progress which was made uh, in terms of the getting uh, people in the in the least developed countries outside of poverty, they are falling back on the poverty, and we do not know that how many more will fall back into the below poverty. So because of the reason that uh, there is a quite a bit the kind of a diversion between the the way the progress are being between the advanced countries and uh, uh, the developed countries, we have to see that how well our recovery goes. Um, move next one, please. Now, I want to share you uh, with this particular chart. Uh, this gives you a comparison that the last great financial crisis, which happened in 2007, 8, and 9, and 10, went on. Um, how much was the economic impact of that versus the economic impact of COVID 19? Uh, only on, on over two years, 2020 and 2021. On the left chart tells you that how many are in terms of the billions of dollars, uh, um, the comparison between the loss of uh, economic value because of COVID versus the financial crisis. Now, one thing is very obvious, which you can see, although the overall developed countries had a certain impact um, and COVID is slightly more than what the impact was on the during the financial crisis. If you go down the list and you will see that the countries like South Asia, Southeast Asia and Africa, uh, that these are the one where the COVID uh, impact is much more than the financial crisis. Reason, one of the obvious reason is the financial crisis was primarily because of those toxic assets and because of developed countries were uh, engaged in those toxic um, assets and with a high leverage. Therefore, they were, their impact was more, but they recovered well. However, the other countries did not get much impacted because of the financial crisis, but they got hit much more because of the, of, uh, of the COVID-19. Similarly, on the right side, if you look at the chart, if you look at the impact in terms of the percentage of GDP, you will see the South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and, and Africa, you will see the impact is almost more than the double um, because of the uh, uh, because of the COVID. So the, if you look at the, again the chart on as far as the developed countries and world countries are concerned, their percentage of GDP has not deteriorated or impacted as much as the as the, as the GDP of the developed country, developing countries and the poor countries. And this is unfortunately a very, um, uh, un, uh, um, it's a very unpleasant uh, um, trend. So continue, please. Next slide, please. Now, um, if you look at this, one of the biggest impact on uh, the developing poor countries is that how much money they are spending uh, in their fiscal space uh, in order to fight the COVID-19. Of course, the whole economic activity was uh, stopped. There were, uh, the government had to step in. They had to stabilize uh, um, uh, the economies. They had to provide uh, uh, stimuluses. Uh, that they had to do many, many um, interventions to ensure that the economies, the people's safety and security are there. However, in that, uh, in during that pursuit, the developing countries end up uh, having a very limited fiscal space. On one side, they were unable to have the revenues, mean the tax revenues and all these other, um, their mode of uh, uh, financing. Um, uh, but however, 
I think the slides have changed. Have, no, okay, okay. So, ho however, um, uh, the, on the other hand, the issue was that the countries has to either uh, support pump a lot of money or borrow more money to continue surviving. So that created a big issue for the developer can, developing countries that how do we handle this much of debt? Is this debt sustainable? Although the G20 did help with a debt uh, service suspension initiative, which will uh, run through, which was run through uh, the June of this year or so, but um, I'd say that gives them, gave the developing countries a little bit of breathing room, but did not help much. So the debt sustainability has created a very big problem, uh, which is that going forward in the future, as you know, that we also have a sustainable development goals of 2030 target in our mind. So we need to make sure that to, to have our, our targets or developing countries target is to achieve those sustainable development goals by 2030. Now, our progress in the developing countries on sustainable development goal was already be, below our uh, par or below expectation. But now with the debt sustainability issue and debt overhang and so much of debt being, being accumulated by the developing countries, there is a serious issue that uh, how far behind we will be in terms of the uh, f f uh, of the meeting the sustainable development goal because if the countries do not have capacity to borrow more they cannot undertake development projects if they cannot undertake development they have a serious issues so i think that is a, one of the biggest challenge which the developing countries especially our member countries in the muslim countries oic countries will be facing going forward and so there is a need to address that issue very urgently. Next, please. Okay, now um, focusing more on the OIC countries, although we were hit uh, pretty bad, but if we look at overall to the OIC countries, we did not do, it was kind of a less severe um, in terms of total loss in the output, but still we got impacted. The areas we got impacted very much one is uh, the, I mentioned this earlier on the terms of growth and poverty and see that how uh, we will be able to continue grow, recover where we should have been uh, without COVID. And at the same time, the, the, as you know, that the, the issue is that these many of the poor people in a, who have fallen below poverty, how do we alleviate? How do we bring them out of the poverty? What programs do we provide to them uh, in that sense. So the biggest issue going forward will be in many of these developing in our uh, member countries OIC, which about 29 of them out of 57 member countries OIC are IDA recipient, which means that they have really very, very poor uh, extreme poverty issue. And they are looking for concessional finance, which means if they are looking for concessional finance, they cannot afford a real uh, you know, market-based uh, finance. Second problem is uh, you have maybe hearing this thing that many of the all, all over the globally because of the government interventions, because of the supply chain disruption, the inflation is quite, uh, it will be, uh, there is a uh, fear of uh, uh, us fa facing the inflation. Although the developed countries thinks that the inflation is temporary, it will go away probably by the middle of next year, but the developing countries we have much more uh, uh, you know, danger of inflation. And also, especially for uh, um, uh, those countries who are now with the oil prices, uh, they have a further problem with the kind of a danger or threat of inflation. Third thing is any of those countries who were pretty much dependent on the commodity exports, or maybe they were dependent on the tourism. Uh, and I know that Indonesia tourism is a big chunk of the economy. These are uh, also severely hit. We don't even know how long it will take come back to the pre-COVID. Maybe we will never get a chance to get back to the pre-COVID situation. So the external accounts of the member countries, our member countries uh, needs to be improved and making sure that um, uh, we do not run into further uh, difficulties or constraints. 
And the third thing is, I think, I, I mean, the fourth thing I mentioned earlier, that we have a serious issue of fiscal and debt situation, um, especially in developing countries. There has been called for the uh, uh, debt write-offs or some uh, ease uh, uh, rescheduling. However, um, we as an MDB has another challenge that we cannot do these uh, write-offs or kind of rescheduling because it impacts us the, uh, our own uh, uh, rating. So these are the major themes which uh, is uh, facing faced by our member countries of Islamic countries and uh, in, in having a robust or resilient COVID-19 recovery. Next, please. Now, I think at next, I mean, again, once we know what our issues are and there are the serious challenges, question is what we could do and what we could look towards Islamic finance. Now, I think there is a um, lot has been written. If you recall that when the financial crisis happened, um, suddenly there was a quite a strong interest in Islamic finance. Uh, reason being because uh, everyone knew the financial crisis is driven by excessive leverage over financialization of the economies, um, over too much debt, and all that uh, issues uh, led to people appreciating what Islamic finance has to offer. Now, unfortunately, uh, Islamic finance did not capitalize on that opportunity, and it did not catch the attention of the policymakers or the key players, and it basically continued to be ignored to, to some extent. Uh, however, I believe that now, uh, unfortunately, the COVID-19 um, also provides us a opportunity for Islamic finance to highlight the key features of the uh, Islamic economic and finance system, which we could learn and see that maybe we could ignore some of this, uh, some of the issues. So main thing, again, where Islamic finance comes into it, there are different aspects where we, we can benefit from Islamic finance. I mean, two key areas are very important. One is, as you know, that the, um, our economic and financial systems are very fragile because of their dependency on total debt, uh, excessive debt and lack of uh, 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 basically uh, having a, some form of risk sharing with uh, among the investors and the borrowers. So one issue is that how do we make sure that our systems going forward in the future are more resilient and are more stable? Um, and of course, much has been written that Islamic finance, the nature of core ideas of risk sharing and the asset-based financing has the inherent features of financial sustainability, uh, financial stability, and that's where it, uh, that needs to be highlighted again. Now, I'll know we know that we cannot change the debt overnight. But I think gradually we need to see that in our recovery or reconstruction post COVID-19, how we could benefit from the Islamic instruments and say that we can shift towards a pure debt-based uh, um, system to a more risk-sharing and asset-based uh, system. So we need to, that, that's the one thing. Other idea, is other kind of a thing, again, we need to remind ourselves that because of uh, uh, many people falling, get, getting back into poverty, Islamic values of compassion and uh, the redistributive uh, uh, instruments like uh, social Islamic social finance, the card, wakaf, and all these needs to be um, strengthened. Means that all these can be targeted towards addressing the alleviation of poverty. Um, I mean, many studies have done, but I recall uh, in a previous place at the World Bank, we did a study uh, which showed that if just zakat alone um, was uh, collected in a certain fashion in a, in a correctly and it was able to implement it correctly it can alleviate poverty in probably more than 50 percent of the oic member countries so i think these are the things we need to re remind ourselves again that what we need to do to revive and present to the world that what um, uh, good features of Islamic finance and idea of economic and social uh, justice can be, uh, should not be ignored in our reconstruction post COVID-19. Next, please. 
Now, uh, you know, there are many areas where we can talk about the Islamic finance for recovery. Uh, I mentioned about the debt sustainability and seeing that uh, how in the long term we could use the risk sharing for reconstruction of resilient and sustainable infrastructure. As you, you may have known that one of the focus by the G20 and other MDBs is that yes, we need to have a, finance, uh, we need to have a, um, a recovery from COVID-19, but that recovery has to be sustainable, resilient, and green. So all these things are, uh, they are, are the wish list of the uh, top policy makers. So, but we when look at Islamic finance, Islamic finance does provide sustainability. It does provide a resilience because it has the, the whole aspect of a, a risk sharing and asset-based finance has a built-in resilience. And the third thing is green and of course our emphasis on the protection of the uh, environment and all this thing gives us a very very strong argument why islamic finance should not be a tool for building a sustainable uh, resilient and a green economies so that's as we reach into that the debt sustainability serious discussion should happen that how do we avoid our dependency on debt and how do we promote uh, islamic finance instruments Second again thing is, how do we build resilience? One of the um, hardest hit um, uh, sectors in, in post COVID-19 COVID was uh, in those entrepreneurs, which were either women, youth, or minorities, and they were hardly hit and SMEs. So what we had to see, what we could do, taking Islamic finance to make sure that we help these particular sectors uh, in uh, building the engine for the growth, which is through SMEs, SMEs. And third, I mentioned about the poverty alleviation. We need to look at the, uh, these core Islamic social finance instruments and to make sure that uh, they are optimized, used optimally so that we can again get back to reviving our target of taking people out of poverty at a shortest period of time. And also sharing the fun, the the, uh, the sharing the prosperity. Now, I would just like very quickly to say that when we uh, at Islamic Development Bank, when the COVID nineteen uh, happened, we were one of the very early MDBs who immediately started to come up with a very comprehensive program. As you know, that all of our operations uh, are Sharia compliant, um, uh, and we have a uh, next next slide, please. Um, so, uh, so we took to undertook a very comprehensive program. So we came up with the three R's. Uh, we, our total package for our member country was amounts to about 4.6 billion. Um, and then we call it as a strategic response and preparedness uh, 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 program. Uh, and that had three R's. Um, so all these three R's were targeted towards the uh, short term medium term and long, long term. Idea was immediately respond to get the member countries respond to the health emergencies and minimize any life and uh, economic activity. The medium term was how, to, how do we restore the economies, especially focusing on the um, micro and SME sector. And the third, the long term was how do we restart? How do we restart, help our member countries towards building sustainable, resilient, and uh, a green uh, economy? So we focus basically on these three R's to make sure that we are uh, provide the best response to our member countries. Uh, next, please. You have one more minute. Prof. Thank you. I'm almost there. This is the last uh, slide. So I think to recap uh, from uh, our what I have mentioned uh, here, although you know there are many things which we need to do. Of course, I would not re-emphasize the issue with the debt crisis which our our uh, OIC countries are facing. Of course, the public sector uh, has to step in and rescue and do all the intervention and to act as a uh, make sure that they protect the economy. I mean, this is very important that the, all the policy makers do have a certain coordination with each other. Uh, all the MDBs during the COVID-19 
were very much uh, um, uh, on uh, together discussing through G20 platform. So, and they were all together on many of these intervention in agreeing what the recovery would be. So uh, I will summarize uh, that uh, the Islamic finance is opportunity is there. As I said, there was great opportunity for Islamic finance to uh, prove itself after the financial crisis of 2007-8, but unfortunately, Islamic finance did not capitalize on it. However, I think this is a now another historic moment for Islamic finance to step up for two reasons. One is, of course, we have a serious issue of debt sustainability, which we need to um, uh, fa we are, we are facing and we need to, to tackle it. Second thing is, uh, with the ongoing rapid development of, uh, in the technology and fintech, it gives a, another um, uh, vehicle to Islamic finance that how the use of fintech can minimize the asymmetrical information to which helps to promote risk sharing uh, and entrepreneurship. I think if you go back to the economic theory, um, uh, because of information asymmetry, by, uh, the lender prefers debt over an equity or risk sharing um, contract. But if because of FinTech, if we have all the information available and the information asymmetry is gone, then there's a much more um, a lender is much more conducive or much more willing to go into an asset based and risk sharing contract. So I think given the, um, the, the developments in the financial technology very developed, I think there's a historical opportunity for Islamic finance. And last is, I know that we or many of our member countries are already very, very um, active uh, in, um, um, in Zakat and Okaf. I know Indonesia is a, and Malaysia has a very strong, um, you know, building of Okaf uh, uh, instrument. However, I think many of these uh, uh, countries or many of these economies do have a governance issues of these uh, instruments. So we need to address those to ensure that we optimize, maximize the utility from these, these things. And we cannot ignore the poor. We cannot ignore the progress made in the last few years to take people outside of poverty. But um, I think we need to focus on, uh, on, on poverty as well. So with that, I really uh, appreciate your patience. And uh, I will uh, uh, stop here. And again, I apologize that, uh, unfortunately, um, I have another meeting after this. So, on, so because of that, then I, would, I will have to excuse myself. But I'm very happy to take any questions um, uh, from the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zemir Iqbal, for your uh, insightful presentation. And uh, we have received uh, a lot of uh, useful and beneficial information. And for the audience, for the all participants, if you have a question, you may put the questions on the chat box. Uh, so we are going to open the Q&A session uh, with uh, Prof. Uh, Zemir Iqbal. So uh, Prof, uh, regarding uh, your presentation, uh, you mentioned about uh, the debt crisis and the fiscal space needs to be uh, created via debt relief or write off uh, for the following countries. So according to your opinion, how we are going to do that? How to ensure that uh, the write-off uh, can be done yeah, uh, for the developing countries. And the second question uh, from uh, Sister Putri, uh, she asked the question about uh, risk sharing in instrument. Uh, applying risk sharing in instrument entails a framework that center on job or real sector creation, not the money creation thus. What is your suggestion to handle the upcoming inflation threat and debt threat, debt trap, sorry, apologize, for developing, developing countries? So uh, maybe these two questions, you may answer this, Prof. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, that the issue of uh, the debt cannot be done overnight. Um, and uh, the debt write-off is also is not a uh, an option, an easy option which we could do. Um, many during when the crisis happened, the G20 was asked to even uh, delay 
the debt. Uh, so there was an initiative. All the MDBs are asked to do a debt suspension um, of the, 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 the. So the given the idea was that developing countries should have more breathing space, and uh, while the, and they should not be paying uh, spending money on the debt servicing and this and that. And G20 on that matter did suspend the um, the debt. However, we as MDB we could not. So I think my view over here is it's not going to happen over overnight, but we should start preparing ourselves that why do we borrow the money? If we borrow money for development projects, why going forward we cannot borrow that uh, or raise that money and mobilize that money on a more um, project finance uh, or on based on the risk sharing means that uh, if we are able to because you know the, the whole building of the infrastructure health the health infrastructure the hospitals which will be needed after post covid 19 and strengthened or resilient health healthcare system and education system that can be done very much very much in terms of a uh, uh, based on the either Islamic uh, asset-based uh, instruments or purely on the risk sharing. So if these products become much more mature, and I think that over the period of time, uh, many of the um, investors are becoming more comfortable with these, but main again thing is that if there is a well-developed ecosystem um, in which these uh, um, uh, instruments could be applied, uh, investor will be very willing to participate in these things. Problem is that that happens because many of the developing countries, there is no ecosystem for the transparent uh, implementation of the projects. And so because of that, investor doesn't like, that doesn't want to go off. So my, my view over here is, um, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. We need to do it gradually. And uh, for that matter, the, the Muslim countries, they should realize that going forward, they should have less reliance on the debt and have more uh, incoming investment, which are based on more uh, where the borrower and the lender has some, uh, some form of risk sharing with each other. That's the one uh, one thing uh, I, I can suggest. Now, other thing, again, I think this was also mentioned about the risk sharing. Now, I think maybe I want to say that when we talk about Islamic finance, it's not only risk sharing, it's also about the asset-based uh, financing. For example, we as an IDB, we issue a sukuk and the difference between our sukuk and a conventional bond is that the, our sukuk is backed by our projects which means that we invest money in our developing countries to build the economic infrastructure. And we take those projects and we securitize those and we issue the sukuk. So which means that uh, it's not only a pure risk sharing and some people think it's a, uh, Islamic finance is only about the risk sharing of equity-based finance or so. No, it is also an asset-based finance, which means that the, any money which is mobilized have to be followed by a real economic, uh, act, uh, you know, the projects. So from that matter, my I think my response would be that we need to come up with a more innovative sukuk where we could securitize some of the assets um, in in a different countries, put them together, and also use that mechanism of sukuk to issue the marketable securities to the global and financial markets, but those money is actually used uh, for the actual um, development of the project for building of the infrastructure. So I hope I answered uh, the, the, those questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Zamir Iqbal, for your answers. And thank you again for uh, sharing your ideas here. And we wish uh, your uh, success in your uh, uh, further program. Thank you very much, Prof. Zamir Iqbal. And now, uh, okay, thank you. And now we are going to continue with the second speaker, which is uh, Professor uh, Muhammad Masum Billah. Uh, Professor Masum Billah, without further ado, I would like to invite you to the stage. So the time and screen are yours. Uh, please unmute yourself, Prof. Is this okay, clear now? Yes, clear, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Irfan Shaugi. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I just want to continue with whatever uh, Prof. Jamir Iqbal uh, uh, shared. Um, 
this uh, in my uh, discussion uh, there are five uh, uh, um, points that i'm going to stress to the first question in mind is uh, with the uh, is what is the impact of uh, uh, economic impact of covid-19 so just uh, i have to glance through and uh, now uh, the what is the strength of islamic economics and finance uh, in the global economic concern. And third point that I'm going to stress is if uh, based on the existing strength or the capacity of Islamic economics and finance, can it uh, contribute to the economic recovery and sustainability? Then if yes, then what is the master plan of it? And uh, in this uh, digital era and uh, its action plan. So these five points that I'm going to uh, share with you. Now, uh, as we know that uh, as uh, uh, in reference to the World Bank data, uh, World Bank data uh, this uh, in 2020, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, highlight here about uh, 10, uh, uh, top 10 uh, economic uh, countries uh, uh, like United States, Japan, and so on. So uh, for the last five years, effective from 2016 to two, the early 2020, the average growth rate was quite significant. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, due to the heat uh, of uh, the COVID-19, COVID the, the total growth rate has been crushed. And uh, uh, in the, those 10 countries that I have listed here, is all decline, you know, and the annual uh, return uh, rate average is uh, uh, minus about 12.2 percent. So, in other words, to sum up here, due to COVID, this pandemic, uh, the economic growth, I mean, the the, the GDP uh, is uh, seriously uh, affected, and the, I mean, the decline. So now, in this particular situation. Uh, uh, what is the stand of Islamic economics and finance? Now, as you know that uh, two days just want to trust here that uh, we have about uh, 526 Islamic banks globally. Besides, we have other financial institutions uh, based on the Sharia principles. And uh, our, uh, the total asset size is about uh, 2.4 trillion. Uh, which is compared to very small. Uh, I mean, the conventional is about 22.5 uh, trillion. And the growth rate of Islamic finance is about annually about uh, 14% uh, compared to conventional one, which is about 9.9%. So uh, the total global um, uh, banking market uh, share is uh, held, uh, I mean, the 6% of the total uh, global uh, banking market share is about uh, is held by the Islamic bank, uh, the Islamic finance. Now, the uniqueness in Islamic finance we have, uh, let's say, the, as, as Professor Zamir Iqbal also mentioned just now, is Islamic banking or Islamic finance is based or asset based with uh, risk sharing, whereas the uh, the conventional is a debt based with risk transferring. Now, the uniqueness here that there are few uniqueness actually. Among them is the Islamic finance is based on the is, is asset base and risk sharing. Now the rate of return that we have uh, realized as a two date, even despite the COVID, the hit by the COVID, uh, the 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 uh, rate of return is about six to fifteen percent depending on the products and services. So they vary, you know, minus zakat. So in other words, to sum up here, that actually. Islamic finance, even though the, it's a very small in the, in the global uh, market share, but it has the strength because of, it has the uniqueness with some characteristics that the, it is based on the asset, is it asset based? And also it has the risk sharing tech, the, the mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. So now uh, this is the, the, the capacity of Islamic uh, uh, finance. Now, the issue here, whether this within this particular capacity uh, can uh, contribute to the global economic re recovery and sustainability, the affected by COVID-19, uh, answer is yes. 
with a further or the further action plan or restructuring a rebranding. So there are four, uh, four strategies that I have highlighted here, mainly the core four strategies. First is there should be a rebranding in Islamic financial products and services. Secondly, there should be an innovative products forcing the digital era. Because if we rely on what we have, even though is it, it the, the Islamic financial products and services is a asset based risk sharing, et cetera, et cetera. But yet we cannot take for granted due to the COVID-19 that whatever had happened, we need to wake up and it, uh, we, uh, it has to be with a new dimension. So now uh, third is the dynamism in services, the professionalism, et cetera. And the fourth is the discovery of emerging markets. So these are the four, four core components or the four uh, strategies that we need to focus in order for us to start the, for Islamic finance, Islamic economics and finance to stand firm to contribute whatever, whatever uh, percentage or whatever uh, the, the, uh, you know, the size can uh, be able to contribute to the global economic recovery at this moment. Now, once we confirm that uh, Islamic finance, Islamic economics have the ability to, to contribute to the global economic recovery and sustainability, now the master plan. These are the master plan actually of uh, Islamic economic finance that we need to have the strategize. And that is how what we could uh, suggest here that 